Welcome back. Well, if Egyptian negotiations fail and Israel and Hamas do not reach a truce, there are some likely scenarios for what might happen between the two parties. Let's explore those a bit. One, Israel could increase its raids into Gaza, like this one just a week ago. A Palestinian teacher was killed during that raid. Similarly, secondly, Hamas could continue its rocket attacks. This one on Monday killed one Israeli woman. But the third thing which could happen is something similar to what happened just a few months ago. Hamas could encourage people to storm the Rafah border crossing with Egypt. It is, of course, the one gateway to Gaza that isn't under Israeli control. And back in January, you might remember, hundreds of thousands of Gazans poured through the border after large sections of the fence along it were blown up. That is part of the reason why Egypt is involved in trying to bring about a truce between the two parties. It obviously doesn't want something like that to happen again. Just this week, Egypt opened up the Rafah crossing to allow Gazans into the country for medical treatment. Still with us, our guests in Cairo, Ezzedin Shokri and Ramallah Hassan Khatib, and in Tel Aviv, Mordecai Khadar. Gentlemen, thank you for staying with us. I'm going to go back to Cairo uh, and speak to uh, Ezzedin Shokri there. We'll talk more about Rafah crossing in a moment. There's a lot to talk about with that issue. But I want to go back to, again, a very basic issue. Go back about five months. The Egyptian foreign minister, Zippy Livni, was criticising a lack of action on the part of the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. What sort of state are Israeli-Egyptian relations in to be able to be effective in any um, process between Israel and Hamas? I think the two countries um, have shown over the last five months that maintaining a positive relationship is important for both of them and also it's important for regional stability um, as a whole i think israel understands that egypt has commitments toward the palestinian people including um, in gaza and that egypt is not going to abandon those commitments just to please it also i think the islamic resistance movement hamas realizes now that Egypt also has commitments towards Israel and that it is going to honor these commitments. So I think the five months, uh, the last five months, were an occasion where everybody tested the uh, positions of, of the others. And now I hope that they reached an understanding of um, where each of them stands. The role Egypt is playing today, I think, is, is indispensable, and, and no other state in the region or outside can play it. And it's important for everyone. It's important for Hamas, because Hamas can't engage in dialogue with either Israel or the US or anybody else for that matter. But it's also important for Israel and, as you have said, for Egypt. So um, this is where we are now. OK, let's put that to Mordecai Kedar in uh, Tel Aviv. Um, seem to be saying there that Egypt is sort of the accepted broker. Do you believe they're the right broker? Uh, we are very much welcoming the efforts of Omar Suleiman, but uh, I suspect that he came to this country for another reason. As you might know, uh, this visit was postponed along the last three or four months for who knows how many times. And, and he only came this, this week after what happened in Beirut at the end of last week, means that what Hezbollah did to Beirut. I think that uh, behind the scenes, uh, the talks with Israel is more about the influence of Iran in this region, which extends all the way to Gaza as well, because as you know, Hamas is being financed by Iran as well. And this is actually what pushed Omar Suleiman to come finally to Jerusalem to, to see how Israel and Egypt are facing together, maybe with other parties in the Middle East, facing together the Iranian octopus, which sends its hands to to Beirut or to Lebanon, to Gaza, to uh, Iraq, okay. to Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump in, I'm sorry, because in the Middle East. I'd like to keep this as much as I can to the three parties we're already talking about without bringing in uh, Iran and Lebanon, otherwise we'd be here for hours. Let's just pause for a moment. Because but this is part I, of the picture. You uh, cannot ignore it. OK, well, I say, as I say, we're discussing very much Egypt, Hamas and Israel at the moment. I just want to pause for a moment and uh, we're going to have a listen to a small sound clip from Khalid Michel, who is, of course, Hamas's top political leader. He was very clear about what he thinks should happen in the event of Egypt's mediation failing. Let's have a little listen to what he said. <laughs> If Israel refuses this Egyptian effort concerning the truce according to the criteria offered by the Palestinian forces, I call on Egypt and Arab states to take a decision to break the siege and unilaterally open Rafah crossing. So unilaterally opening the Rafah crossing. Uh, Hassan Khatib in uh, Ramallah, what do you make of that statement? Do you think that would be uh, backed up? Well, I think that this is uh, a little bit uh, uh, embarrassing for Egypt 
and uh, uh, Mash'al keeps um, hinting uh, uh, into a possible Hamas pressure on Egypt. Uh, in previous speeches also, he hinted to the fact that uh, uh, Gaza might explode uh, in the face of everybody. Uh, and and uh, there are two sides surrounding uh, Gaza, one Israel and the other is uh, Egypt. And I think that referring to the Rafah crossing, regardless uh, to the previously signed agreement, which gives the international community, uh, uh, particularly the Europeans uh, and Israel, certain uh, uh, role uh, concerning the opening of Rafah is going to be uh, embarrassing to Egypt. And I think that this is coming in the course of putting pressure on Egypt. I think this is very dangerous because part of the Israeli plan when they withdrew from Gaza is to try to uh, disintegrate Gaza from the West Bank and throw Gaza to the laps of Egypt. So when Hamas start to put pressure on Egypt in order to solve the problems of Gaza resulted from the Israeli siege, uh, then they are falling uh, to the trap that Israel has already uh, put. Uh, and that's why I think that such a statement uh, is very dangerous, not only for the Palestinians, but also for the Egyptians. Dangerous for the Egyptians, Ezzedin Shokri. What do you make of that? I think if the negotiations fail and the crossings are not open in a regular way, I think Egypt will have to expand the uh, hours and days of opening of Rafah um, for emergency cases, medical and otherwise, but and this also is the thing. for humanitarian this is, assistance. This is the thing, sorry to interrupt you, but what is, maybe you can explain for us, people who aren't aware, what is actually stopping Egypt from taking proper control of Rafah now, managing it properly, opening it, allowing it to be used uh, safely and, and, and properly? What is stopping Egypt? I'll tell you, there is, we have to distinguish between two, uh, two status of open, when we say opening the crossing, what does this mean? If we're talking about letting humanitarian assistance cross, if we're talking about evacuating the sick and the needy and emergency cases, Egypt is doing this and has been doing it, and I think it will do it in the future. If we are talking about regular and ordinary opening where individuals can cross with their passports, get them stamped and travel and back and all this, then we're talking about um, uh, implementing a sort of agreement. There has to be some kind of an authority on the Palestinian side to uh, implement the procedure for crossing. Mordecai Kedar in Egypt Tel Aviv. Would... Sorry, I'm just going to jump in because we are starting to run a little short of time. Sure. Mordecai Kedar in Tel Aviv, yeah. what do you make of that? I guess Israel's fear is always that an opening of the, of the crossing means an easier way for weapons to get in and out. Do you think Rafa could be properly managed? Uh, what I am afraid of is because of what happened that, like an hour ago that a missile, a Grad missile, uh, which was launched from Gaza to Ashkelon and injured few people. I think this will push Israel to a very big action in Gaza. And uh, I, I really don't know, not, don't know what will be the future between Israel and Gaza because, uh, uh, because of what Hamas is doing, I think leaves us no other choice but to hit them again and with, with much of pressure because this is the only way to deal with them, because they are not willing to stop this rain of missiles over Israel. And I really, and, and, and not like what uh, Mr. El Khatib said, we do not occupy Gaza anymore. We went out from every millimeter from Gaza. But you Gaza control it, don't you? To the lines, which was before until 67. We hold nothing from Gaza. Gaza, we have nothing. But Unlike you control it. What about, what about Gaza the flow is of free. fuel and, and things in there? You control all of that. Look, we don't give fuel not to, not to Syria and not to, not to Egypt and not to uh, Jordan. Let the Gaza dig in the sea and take the oil of, out of there. They have a big uh, oil field, which we gave it to them for free. We found it and we gave it to them. Why don't they do this? They do not need us. Okay, All they need I'm, us in, in order I, to I'm blame jump us in. for their own faults. I'm going to jump in, I'm afraid, because as always, we've run out of time. The situation sounded so simple at the start of this show. Unfortunately, in reality, as we've seen, there are so many obstacles. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us and thank you, our viewer, for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. As always, you can email them to insidestory at aljazeera.net. From the whole team, goodbye for now.